Hi, and welcome to Spooky Isles. My name is David Saunderson, and today we're joined again by John West, the author of Britain's Haunted Heritage. And today, John, you're going to be talking about the Suicide House of Ealing, uh, aka 16 Montpellier Road. Now, that's, that's quite a famous case. Uh, Andrew Green, the, the very famous uh, ghost hunter, is at the centre of that. Can you, can you tell us why it's a, a, a case that we're still talking about many years later? Yeah, it's, it's such a, a fascinating story. Andrew Green got involved in it. He was 17 at the time. This is before he became an author of so many books on ghosts and that. His father was a, a, a resettlement officer working for Ealing Council in the 1940s. And it was in uh, May 1944. And he was looking for a house to store furniture from bond out houses. Uh, so he found this house and, and looked around it and he found it was free from vermin and damp. The only problem was there was a, a strong smell of sulphur coming from a particular room and it seemed to reoccur every 28 days. So he advised that, you know, use the house but keep that room sealed. So they did. And he got some workmen in uh, to check it out, Andrew Green's dad. And they left after three hours because they didn't like the atmosphere. And on top of that, they heard footsteps and their tools went missing and they said look we we don't want to know so they they legged it basically and he had to get work with him from a further afield because they had a bit of a reputation in his house and he didn't realize that at the time and he actually went to the local police station and spoke to a sergeant and the chap said yeah um it, it's called the suicide house there's been 20 suicides there and at least one murder and it turned out the house dated from 1883 it was owned by it was built by a chap called dunlop who was a, a colonial judge and uh, apparently the first suicide occurred in 1887 it was an, a lady uh, a girl called uh, Anne, and she threw herself from a, a tower because it was neo-gothic because you know the victorians love neo-gothic buildings and she threw herself from that particular tower anyway so he, he left it alone and then he had to go back um a few months later and he said to his son he said would you like to see a haunted house now andrew green wasn't interested in ghosts at the time but he, he intrigued him so he went along and he took his camera as well, just to, um, you know, because he wanted to take some pictures as, as memento. And he looked around the house, he explored the cellars. He found the, the sulfur room as well, which was sealed. And he looked through the keyhole and he could see a Bunsen burner and, and some other scientific equipment. So it was obviously being used as a lab, you know, for, for whatever. But then he, he decided to climb the tower and he went through a trap door. And as he did so, he felt as if hands were helping him along. And he looked back thinking it was his dad. There was no one there. And he thought, well, that's a bit weird. Now, a lot of people would have legged it at that point, but he was very brave and obviously mm. carried on. He climbed out onto the parapet. And he also noticed on, on the stones, on the windowsill, like carvings as well, like, almost like magical symbols. But he didn't think much of it at the time. But then an inner voice spoke to him and said, you know, why don't you step off into the, off the parapet and, and go into the garden below? You won't get hurt. And he was actually going to do this. And then all of a sudden, his dad appeared from nowhere and pulled him back and said, you know, we've had enough. we don't want any suicides in the family, son. But Andrew Green later wrote that he was convinced that if he'd stepped off that parapet, nothing would have happened to him. He would have been safe. And he did wonder, was that connected with all the suicides? Had they been driven to it by some force? But but anyway, um, it was a... Uh, he, he spoke, he told his mum about it as well. It turned out she'd gone to that house once. She was a nurse and there'd been a, a suicide and murder there. Uh, in the 30s, uh, a nursemaid had thrown uh, a child out the window and then followed it. She'd thrown herself from the tower, uh, as all the other suicides had. And uh, while the doctor was attending the bodies, she saw footprints appear in the grass and the sound of someone sitting on a bench, which obviously naturally shocked her. And she told the doctor about it. I think it was, the doctor was called Pye. And he said, oh, God, nothing surprises me with this house. But he wouldn't go into any more detail. So it was left at that. Well, anyway, Andrew Green um, ended up uh, joining a drama society. And this was in, in the early 1950s. And ironically enough, they decided to hold rehearsals at Montpellier, Montpellier Road, the, the house because the, uh, the the director of the play, I think his name, I'll just check it actually, just so I'll give you the right, right name, Ken Yandel, and he was also a BBC producer, and uh, they were doing a play called The Poltergeist, uh, which is oh. quite ironic. And um, now, Andrew Green never mentioned anything about the hauntings, but 
Mr. Yandley said that he was having problems in the house. He said, my dog goes crazy every 28 days as if it's attacking someone, literally fighting some unseen assailant. He said, we also hear footsteps. He said, we get terrible smell of sulfur as well. And, uh, you know, Andrew Green thought, well, yeah, that's, that's interesting because, you know, it backs up what, what I experienced and what I heard. But anyway, um, what happened the first night of rehearsals, all of a sudden, the, one of the actresses became possessed and said that she was called Anne. And she said, oh, I didn't mean to kill myself. I just wanted to step into the garden. Now, Andrew Green hadn't mentioned about this girl that supposedly killed herself in 1887. So how did she know about it? So was it a genuine possession? Mm. You know, who knows? But then the second rehearsal, they heard footsteps in, in, in the, the room and no one could make out where it was coming from. And the play seemed to be jinxed. Uh, the leading man was killed in a car crash. One of the ladies got uh, badly injured in a plane crash. And the, the director, you know, Ken Yandel, just said, oh, look, forget it. This is jinxed. So they, they, they jacked at him. But Andrew Green spoke to him, I think it was a couple of years later, and he confirmed that he said, I had to put my dog down because it just went totally crazy. We couldn't do anything with it in the house. And he said, I also almost died in the house. And he said, well, how did that happen? He said, well, we had friends staying around for a party. And he said, I elected to sleep in, in the bathroom. And he said, my wife heard me in the early hours of the morning gasping for breath. She rushed in. He was taken to hospital, hospital and it turned out he was suffering from sulfur poisoning. And they couldn't understand where it come from. And the matron actually said if it had been another 30 minutes, he would have died. And it turned out his, bed, his bathroom was where the old uh, lab had been. Okay. So that was intriguing. And then in 1960, uh, Andrew Green went on a TV show. I think it was called Jim's Inn. And he's, he's uh, one of these script writers actually said, oh, God, I, I've moved into this place. I'm having terrible trouble with... Uh, smell of sulfur every 28 days and because it turned out it was 16 Montpellier Road well anyway um Andrew Green wrote a book in the early 70s Our Haunted Kingdom which is a brilliant book to get you know if you're interested in ghosts get it and he wrote about his experiences oh I also forgot to mention that Andrew the first time he went there he took a photograph as they left the house and there was a photograph of a girl in the window mm. and People looked at it, the Royal Photographic Society looked at it, uh, psychics looked at it, and it wasn't faked, it wasn't double exposure. So he could not explain that. So that's on the internet, you can look that up, that photograph. It looks like a girl, so is it Anne? And as I said, he took that the first time he went there, so apologies I didn't mention that before. But anyway, the, the house was knocked down in 1970, and he did his book, and he got loads of letters about the haunting, including one from a maid who said that she'd worked in the house in the 1920s and that the family then, it wasn't a Dunlop, so they'd moved out in 1916. Uh, the new family, uh, she said they're into black magic, witchcraft, she said, because every Friday they used to hold whatever in the, in the tower using black candles. And also the, the uh, butler that he had, it later turned out he committed suicide. She also claimed that she found hidden under some loose floorboards some razors which were wrapped up in uh, cuttings of Jack the Ripper and the Duke of Clarence. And uh, so there was that sort of like royal connection with the Ripper. And I, I think that was probably her imagination because at that time there was a lot going on about a royal conspiracy, which is now being discredited. But anyway, she she said, you know, there were terrible things went on there and she left because, you know, obviously it spooked her about the black masses and everything. And um and Andrew Green often used to write about it in other books and lecture about it. And then he died in 2004 and a chap called uh, Alan Murdy uh, took over his estate and got all his papers and that. And he ended up interviewing a descendant of the original Dunlop who built the house. And the descendant poo-pooed the idea. He said, oh, well, we, you know, we left the house in 1916 because we had financial problems. There might have been a suicide in the 19th century, but I've never heard of a girl called Anne. And he said, I think all the stories of black magic are a load of rubbish. But then again, he hadn't even been born when the family had moved out. So obviously he hadn't been in the house at the time. And so he couldn't really talk about black magic because it was a different family. But so that's how it stands. And uh, today, if you go to the site, there's a block of flats, um, very ugly block of flats, I have to hmm. say, and um, slightly built to the south of the original house. But people in the flats have said they heard bangs, knocks, funny, had funny feelings. And on top of that, apparently the, the garden out the front, which is to the north of the flats, um, where the house originally stood, people have gone there and have felt a sort of uh, evil force, shall we say. They feel very uneasy and are glad to, to leave. 
So there, there possibly is something still there. So that, that's the story of the the suicide house of Elin. But like I said, check out the photograph of the girl. I think there was a, definitely a genuine case there. Uh, too many things happened for it all to be sort of, you know, a misunderstanding or even people making it up. And that photograph is convincing proof to me. Um, it looks like a girl to me. I know other people have said, oh, well, it's a smudge and people just assume it's the figure of a girl. But how do you explain Andrew Green's experiences there? Um, you know, what happened in the 1950s with a drama group and, you know, the mm. chap almost died basically of sulphur poisoning in a room where there was no sulphur. What do you, uh, I mean, you, you've said there's there's too much there for it to be coincidence. Could you give it an explanation of a scientific explanation? Or you just think there's just, like, you're just playing it devil's advocate? Like, what, what do you think was going on there, assuming it wasn't anything supernatural? Um... Well, I, I think there was a super supernatural element. I, I discount the the business with the, the Jack the Ripper uh, yeah. ra razors, and uh, I just think that was a fantasy because of what was going on at the time with you know all the royals were involved in the Ripper murders. I, I discount that totally, but there was obviously some sort of energy there, and I often found with certain places, I've been to places where they got a negative energy. So was there some force there? Uh, a malevolent force that was um, urging people to kill themselves because Andrew Green felt it. You know, he yeah. wanted him to get off that parapet and, and step into the garden. He would have been killed if he had done. So, yeah. again, you know, I, I have to say there's no records of the other suicides because, sadly, a lot of the, the records for that area were destroyed in the war. So we can't go back and check, you know, about the murder and the lady who threw the baby out the window and things like that. I, I believe there was something there, and it was... Uh, psychically inclined definitely I, I can't explain it a way otherwise you know like someone dying of sulfur fumes in a room where there was no sulfur and you know what andrew green experienced and all these people that said yeah it had a terrible reputation what do you think we could learn from this case you know what what have you learned from this case well basically you've got to be very very careful when you investigate in haunted locations because um there's the old adage isn't there a ghost can't hurt you but i've it's not that many cases, but there are cases where people have been hurt. Mm. So you've always got to be very wary. And if there is, uh, uh, I mean, it's like sort of certain areas I've come across that attract suicides. It's like Cleopatra's Needle in in London. Um, I wouldn't linger there too long because I do feel perhaps that negative energy from all those people who took their lives imprints itself into the fabric of the building or in the monument or even the ground and somehow it, you, people can tap into it and it could influence them so that that's my theory and like i said I'm, I'm open to other suggestions um but i do believe something was definitely there i don't andrew green wouldn't have why would he lie about it you know yeah well why does this case not have the kind of fame that other cases do because I mean, it was, it's clearly got everything there you know, it's got all the aspects we want. Like, as you said, you know, there's tension of, you know, Andrew Green nearly threw himself off a off a tower. Why, why is it not yeah. more famous than it is? Yeah, and if he had it done, we would have lost out on right. those great books. But I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've written about it in my book. It's been featured in Andrew Green's books. It's been featured in other books, articles and that. I, perhaps because it's no longer there and the building that's replaced it is a rather sort of ugly early 70s block of flats so there's no sort of glamour there but there again Borley Rectory's gone uh, but there again you've still got the church opposite but then you, so. Harry Price was much more of a showman than uh, Andrew Green yes. so you know that's yeah. probably probably half yeah. the thing isn't it about publicity yeah, exactly. isn't it so yeah, yeah. anyway it, it should be more famous definitely but uh, for some reason like you said it's probably because Andrew Green wasn't the sort of the publicist that uh, Harry Price was and didn't get it out there as, as much as uh, perhaps he should have done. And you're saying that the place is no longer there. It's a, a, a block of flats, but there is something to see. So you, yeah. if people wanted to go and have a look, they could have a look. But uh, unfortunately, the, the property is not there anymore. Yeah. I mean, most of the other houses down that road are sort of Victorian Edwardian, so you can still get a feel for that, that period of time. But as I said, and you can go to behind the flats and you'll, you'll see the ground where the house once stood. So, but don't linger there too long, I would uh, advise. Oh, no. I think that'd be right. Just, uh, yeah, but, uh, it doesn't sound like a great place. Anyway, once again, John, thank you for that. That's, uh, that's, that's in your book, Britain's Haunted Heritage, which is a fabulous book. Uh, and we'll look forward to talking to you next time about uh, hauntings around Britain. Thank you, thank you.